Hey everybody, welcome to What The Tech, I'm Andrew Zarian. Of course, I'm joined by Paul The Rot. How you doing, Paul? Pretty good. Pretty yeah. good. Me too. Yeah, it's been busy. You know? I bet. I mean, there's a lot going on. Uh, there were a couple announcements this week. Uh, you know, the WWE did a press release saying that the wrestlers are going to be wearing the um, their bands and you could, yeah. you know, monitor Andrew. their statistics throughout the week. Andrew. Yes, sir. What the hell are you talking about? That's it. You sent it to me. <laughs> <laughs> you sent me a link, and then it was That's with right. like some smart ass answer too. That was the best part. You're like, huh? You would like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, like somebody sent it to me, like a PR person, and yeah. I was like, huh? No, you got the wrong guy here. Yeah, we should be going to Andrew. Um, I guess a couple hours ago, the announcement for the Surface Three came out. Yeah. And it looks pretty good. I mean, I, I was going to do notes, but I, I, I think this is going to transi- transition into something uh, else. So I said, you know what? I'm not even going to bother with the notes. It's freeform. Uh, yeah, we'll just, we'll just go and talk about this. But I want to go into the topic. But I actually saw it on your website on therot.com, the new source for all things Paul Therot, guys. If you want uh, if you want to follow up Paul's writing and everything that Paul's interested in, go to therot.com. Uh, a lot of good stuff. And you're putting out so many. I mean, I'm looking today, right? Today, there's like four posts already. Yeah. It's only three o'clock, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more. So, therot.com, yeah, already, but, yeah. go check it out. Uh, let's talk about the Surface. Okay. A lot of confusion over this. You know, a lot of people were telling me, I guess they didn't read yeah. the the article. Like, when they saw Surface 3, they go, well, don't mm-hmm. we, isn't, doesn't this exist already? And I go, no, it doesn't. Surface Pro does. Surface 3 doesn't. Surface Pro 3 does. And then they were asking me, well, is this, is this Windows RT? No, it is not Windows RT. Well, what does this mean for the future of Windows RT? And I think that it's pretty clear what it means for the future of Windows <laughs> RT. I, I, I mean, well, by the way, I, I'm confused by that question because the future of Windows RT was made very clear at the January event. Uh, they're not updating it to Windows 10. There is no future. There is n- there's RT. no that's RT. That's the end of that's that discussion. It. Yeah. yeah, it's it's over. Um, it's a full-fledged version of Windows. I think what, what people are confused about is... There was a drastic line, you know, a dramatic line in the sand between the features of Windows RT and Windows. Yeah. And now they think it's kind of the same thing, you know, Pro 3 and then 3. Well, there has to be a difference. Well, difference is specs, really. That's what it really comes down to. Pro 3 is a beefier computer and and the regular Surface is not. It's, it's an entry level, you know, it's whatever most people are using. Uh, this looks like a great little device. Uh, four ninety nine starting price, and I think we were talking earlier. You said it, it would build up all the way to like eight ninety nine if you get everything. Yeah, I mean, if you throw the whole kit and caboodle in there, because you can you can upgrade the RAM and the uh, the storage when you buy it. Um, you can get a type cover, and you should, and you could buy the pen, and when and you could go LTE, you know, and so everything I just described, it's like a hundred bucks, hundred bucks, and then fifty bucks. Um, you know, 250 bucks, you, you get up into, you know, higher end territory there. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this device and mm-hmm. why now, why release this device now? Is it just the timing is right? And, you know, the chipsets are yeah. out and, you know, now you have the two, I guess this is not the M by the way. Uh, right. another, another Which is thing. One of the first big sign, you know, uh, yeah. uh, confusing parts for people. Yeah. It's not, it's not the M chipset. It's the, uh, X7. Which is their Atom chipset. Which is their brand new Atom chipset, right? Yeah. So this is the Cherry Trail. This is the first device to ship with this chipset. And in my, I mean, from what I've read, uh, mm. and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, this is a better chip than the, than the M. Well, okay. So for, for a couple, well, battery life <laughs> and performance. Yeah, better is a tough word. It's, it's different, right? I mean, the, the Core M is an attempt to take their full powered core i processor line down to better mobility so i believe it has a smaller die size uh and the theory here is that with less heat you could theoretically not always but you could have systems that don't have fans um hopefully you would see better battery life but that has not materialized in the real world and we see that on the apple side too with the new macbook it does not get dramatically better battery life like you would think with the m compared to you know their their 
I guess a MacBook Air with a Core i5. With a Core you know. i5, yeah. It, it, it's you're not getting. Yeah. It. So the M is you know, the M the M in some ways is old school Intel. It's the let's take what it's sort of like the. Um, like the Pentium M from days gone by. Yeah, let's take, let's take the chip and then slow it down a little bit and see what happens. Yeah, and we'll yeah, yeah we'll we'll shrink the die size, but it's the same fundamental core. Um, you know, it's the it's the way Intel has historically done things. You know, the Atom is a different kind of chip, and obviously Atom has its own stigma. In fact, if I, if I were Intel, I would never I would have dropped the Atom brand by now. It's, oh God, it's years ago, horribly tainted. Well, it's um, the Atom and the Celeron. I mean, they were both bad, and yeah. the Celeron still exists, right? Yeah, so does Pentium, yeah. you know, which is bizarre to me. But, uh, you know, okay, whatever. But uh, And I can't, I can't tell you that this Atom processor solves all the problems, you know, performance-wise that Atom has had in the past. Intel says it does. Microsoft says it does. Um, I'll let you know when I get one how it really works in the real world. But the theory on this one is that the Atom is more of an ARM-style chip, a Nouveau-style chip. It's, it's designed for mobility from the ground up. Uh, it's not a core product that's been, you know, brought down uh, market, and we'll see. And so it's it's more efficient for, uh, you know, battery life, obviously, and then the performance, you know, we'll see because it's obviously it's not going to perform as well as a real core chip. But uh, Windows has been modified over the last few years, especially to work very well on lower end systems with uh, slow processors, less RAM, uh, and less storage. And, you know, we'll see how it does. You know, we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, but um, I. Performance-wise, uh, the M is better. I mean, when you're talking spec-wise, you know, actual CPU performance. But mm -hmm. everyday use, uh, I, this 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 Atom chip, the X7, may perform better considering, yeah, it may. you know, on this device, how much are you going to push it? You know, how... I don't know. You, I think they both... You want my opinion? I think both chipsets still are not that great. I think they're both compromises. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I, I, yep. and we're a good year or well, you two know away from that, uh, okay. you know, from them getting it. The truth is all processors are a compromise. You know, you, you, when you get the full power of an, a Core i5, a Core i7, um, the compromise there is going to be heat, right? Yeah. It's going to be a battery life, you know. So when it comes to mobile devices, you know, it, it, it depends. It's these devices that are kind of on the, the border between two categories that kind of suffer the most. When you have a, a smartphone, it makes sense to throw an ARM chip in there, and it works great for that kind of uh, system. If you have a gaming laptop or a desktop computer or whatever, obviously full-size core processors are great. But when you get into the middle, it's tough. You know, like a, a full-size laptop, you know, core products, those seem to work pretty well, and obviously they can get tremendous battery life uh, depending on the system. Um, but when you get you know, the, you get a little sm you know, smaller, between a phone and between a laptop, you know, that's where... It's a little squishy, you know, what is the best way to go? Well, what are they going to do? See, this is where the confusion is for a lot of people. Uh, we understand the surface line. We understand what this is. But yep. are we going to see, uh, you know, non-Intel-based versions of devices like this? So, I think so. Um because that's what RT was, you know. Yeah. RT was okay. Well, if you want to put ARM on a, on a laptop, you can, but you're going to get RT. You're not going to get Windows. Right. So what happens now? <laughs> to, yeah, to that? yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, it's not completely clear. I think this is one of those things that we're still not completely clear on. Uh, there, this, and it falls. By the way, it's the same kind of crossover products where it's not clear. Um, Windows 10 Mobile will absolutely be available in ARM versions because a lot of those devices will be phones and phablets. Um, will there be small tablet versions of Windows 10 Mobile? Yes, I think absolutely that are not phones. I think we will see that. Um, the question is, will we see a bigger device running an ARM-based version of Windows 10? And it's theoretically possible, but I don't believe so. I don't know. It depends on the device size, I think. Yeah, I, but why you would you? won't have a desktop, right? Well, you can't yeah. have a desktop. But why would you do it? You know, let, let's. I mean, that's the other thing. If if Intel now has these chips that are going to perform, yeah. I, well, I, mean, I, I, well. I, I mean, look, I I happen to agree with you. I actually think that the choice that you have on an Intel-based system outweighs any of the issues. That even on a, an eight-inch tablet, just the ability to run iTunes, if that's what you want or what, that's what you use, the ability to run Chrome, even though it may kill your battery life, um, if you're in that world. <laughs> Those capabilities are nice to have. Is your uh, studio falling apart there? Or I, I just, yeah, everything is falling. I have no idea what that was. 
But, you know, uh, the people who bought into the RT vision will tell you, and, and not without justification, that there's something really nice about a system that is kind of a walled garden, that it's, it's known to be safe. You're not going to put anything stupid on there. You can't install an application that is malicious or even an application that not because it's malicious, but because it's poorly written. I like, mean, Paul, look, look, at, yeah. look at what Apple's doing on, on the Macs. You can, I mean, unless it's, you cannot install a third party application on a Mac unless you go into the security settings and turn that stuff off. Is that true? Yeah. Um, unless, like, you can install Skype, for example, right? Like, yeah. Skype, you okay. can. But if it's like Paul Therat and you made some app, you know, mm -hmm. you, you're, you're a developer, it'll tell me that this is not an auth, you know, a certified application to install. Interesting. I've had that happen um, multiple times, and I was actually surprised on the applications because you know they were, uh, they were like well-known applications. I can't think of the name right now. If, uh, I'll give yeah. an example. Like let's say TeamViewer, for example. I went to install TeamViewer, and it's on like the the level of notoriety, and okay. it gave me that error where it's it said it gave me that pop up it said you cannot install this. So I had to go and turn off the it, turn it off in the security. Well, software. I mean, w Windows will actually flag dubious applications, and you can over. Right. You could override it. This one you can't it's even probably, override it. There's no like OK button, <laughs> you know. Say yeah. screw you. We know better. You want to download something? Go to our app store. Uh, well, but okay, well, I mean, yeah, but that's the Apple. I, I don't know anything about the Mac or how yeah. that works. But the, you know, obviously there's there there are benefits to that kind of thing. I mean, there, and there are there are downsides, and so it's kind of a compromise. It depends on where you fall. Uh, on either end, but I think you know in the Windows world, the the kind of rich ecosystem of apps is all on the desktop side. It's not on the macro yeah. side or the modern side, and you know that's an advantage. And so it's there if you need it. It's not if you don't. It's fine. It it doesn't necessarily hurt you. Um, I think this is the right way to go. I, no, I, mean, I agree with it. I think I definitely think so. And you know what? These are this is the feature of Windows. Uh, you know, I'm looking at it right now. I mean, the stock looks a little silly. This picture, obviously, but. Yeah, sure. You know, but these these are actually. You know, what, it's it's interesting how different that is from the Surface Pro Three dock because it covers the ports on the side, and it, it must be on purpose because um, the Surface Three, the the lower end version, is USB bus based, and so they don't they can't have you using the ports on the device and the ports on the dock at the same time because you can't drive, you know, Mini Display Port and more USB over that. Yeah connection you know so let's go over to specs a little bit mm -hmm. uh it, the surface 3 starting is going to be two gigs of ram 64 gigs of 64 gigs of storage uh which is actually i'm surprised that's that's a good amount uh it's going to be 499 so if you add the cover and everything so the real price is going to be between 630 and 680 if you want the pen also so that's the actual price let's see five 630, 680, yes. Yeah. Uh, so the next model up, you get 128 gigs of storage, mm -hmm. gigabytes of storage, and four gigabytes of memory, uh, costing 599 So if you add the cover, 730 Yep. Add and the LTE two more version, models. you yeah, get LTE an LTE version, and that's with the cover, it's, so it's 880 And yeah. what was the other one? I think that was it. Six. It was um, 680 so it would be 780 for that. 780 yeah. Yeah. It's not cheap. No, I mean, and and I, the one thing I'll say though is, uh, you know, Surface Pro three starts at what seven ninety nine, I think, without a type cover, so eight thirty, and so now you have this kind of wider product range that hits a much broader range of prices, which I think is important, and satisfies a bigger market because I think a lot of people looked at the Surface Pro three, which is undeniably a success for them, and said, you know, I yeah, I like this thing, but it's too expensive, you know, and. I, I think there's a big market of people, especially students, consumers, uh, that want this kind of device. And and the pen capabilities will be amazing for students. The fact that it's a, pull, a full PC will be amazing for students. The fact that it could be a tablet or a PC, of course, is amazing. And it's just a, a part of the whole And it's, it's not like using a pen on an iPad, obviously. No, no, no. This yeah. is the real deal. Yeah. yeah. This is, this is you know, an yeah, act. Pressure sensitivity yeah. and, yep. yep. Uh, it's a great looking device. Uh, I mean, so I, I asked you a question uh, on Skype, and I was surprised by your answer because this is cutting it close <laughs> to the release of Windows 10, you know, a couple months oh, away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, is this going to be like a reference point device where the OEM should follow this? You know, if this is the type right. of thing you want to do, these are the specs these devices should have. And you said, no, mm -hmm. it's not. 
right. this has nothing. Uh, you know, well, it's it has nothing, nothing like a specific point. to Windows specific 10. Specific to Windows 10, like unless the they're hiding Iris. something. I mean, we'll. I guess people will take it apart and we'll find out. But um, here, here's the thing. So, uh, you know, people have been expecting a Surface Pro four. So when this thing comes out, I think a lot of people are like, wait, what? Why would they do this? You know, but the the truth is, since Surface has been around, which has only been a couple of years, there's always been a, a a non-pro model and a pro model, right? And obviously, the non-pro models previously were were RT based. Um, last year, the plan was, and right up until the last minute, and they actually manufactured a bunch of these things before they canceled it, was to make a Surface Mini device, which was going to replace the Surface Two in the marketplace would be ARM and RT based. It would obviously have like a an 8-inch form factor. That device was not going to come with a keyboard. Um, there was a cover for it, but it was not a keyboard cover. And, um, you know, it was a different kind of thing. And, and that would have changed the whole Surface outlook. Um, but Satya Nadella had just become CEO. They had the whole executive committee get together, and it was Stephen Elop and Nadella and uh, other higher-ups. And one of the decisions they made was that this Surface Mini thing doesn't make to make any sense. A, it's late to the market. Uh, B, it was kind of an Intel thing. They have a big partnership with Intel, and Intel was really pushing on uh, Intel-based designs. And um, it was just, and they were getting rid of Windows RT in the yeah. Windows 10 gen. And it, it just didn't, didn't make sense. sense to sell something like that and then come out and say, oh, and by the way, uh, you're not getting the update to the very next version of the OS. Not, not that late in the game. And so Surface... Three, in many ways, is a reaction to what happened two year, to, uh, last year. So it's what I just described. But it's also the success of Surface Pro 3, which, by the way, uh, ironic is not the right word, but you tend to overuse that term. But it is somewhat ironic because Surface Mini was the big Surface last year. And this was, was, that was the gonna, small announcement. This was the like Surface the, Pro 3 oh, was the, the sideshow. Oh, and by the way, we're making a, th- a, a Pro 3. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so when they killed the Mini, Surface Pro 3 kind of became the big story. But the funny thing is Surface Pro 3 became the big success story as well. And I, uh, granted, it was the only machine released last year. But I think it would have been anyway. I think even if the Mini had come out, Surface Pro 3 would have been the success story uh, regardless. And so it doesn't matter. It was. And I think the success of Surface Pro 3 and the fact that all that stuff was happening with RT. Well, it was, you know what them, it was? It, it was actually it was a phenomenal machine. I mean, it was built really well. Yeah, uh, It yeah. felt great when you use it. The yeah. performance was great. I, I mean... There's well, it's n- funny. I mean, but think about, you know, it's if you go back, and this is literally go back a year, and you're Microsoft, and you're making new Surface devices, and what's out in the market at the time is Surface Pro 2 and Surface 2, and you want to improve on both of those things. It's really funny how you do that, because for the Pro device, you're going bigger, because that's what people who use Pro devices need. They use Ultrabooks. A 10-inch screen is not cutting it. But on the consumer side, on the student side, you go smaller. That was the conventional wisdom at the time. And so the, the non-pro device was going to get smaller, the pro device was going to get bigger, and that's where they were going to go. And that, that thing that in the middle, the 10.8 inch whatever, that was previously all Surface devices, was actually just going to go away. And now it's a year later and things have changed completely. And so, um, you know, who knows if there'll ever be a Surface Mini at this point. It doesn't seem to make any sense, although there are some people who obviously want one. Um, but the success of Surface Pro 3 caused them to rethink this thing again. And so it is smaller, but it's not a lot smaller. It has a 3, point, three by 2 aspect ratio screen, which I think is important because it helps it look na- more natural in tablet form. And they intend for this thing to be used in tablet form, like in portrait orientation, yeah. where you're writing on it with a pen and so forth. And so, you know, Surface Pro 3, I think, was successful enough that they recalibrated their plans away from what they were going to do before. And so what we see basically is a cost-reduced Surface Pro 3, which ultimately I think was the right decision. Yeah, and I guess I, I'm, I'm curious, will the Surface 4 be fanless? Because that was something that we were talking about last year when they announced the Surface 3. I think we were all sitting there and ooing and eyeing over the Surface Pro 3, and we were saying, well, you know what? The next one is probably going to not have a fan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, I don't think... I'm going to chip- guess no, not the Pro. I think yeah. what they're going to have to do... Well, A, they sort of telegraphed it a little bit. Um, sometime last summer, I think it was last August or something, they, they made an announcement, which was basically a, um, a declaration to businesses that they would retain compatibility with accessories for the next version of Surface Pro, meaning okay. that uh, everything that they're selling today will work fine with the new product. And that tells me that the new product is almost certainly going to be exactly the same form factor. Um, so it will fit in a dock, and it will just work. So that you'll clip on a type cover, and it will fit the screen exactly. It will just be the same. So I think Surface Pro 4... 
the form factor is going to be the same, same thickness, same venting for the fans, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, who knows? That doesn't mean there isn't a fan, but I think the venting continues and the thickness continues. I mean, I, I do actually think there will be a fan, but I don't think that matters so much. The other thing I think is, the differentiator, sorry. Why, why, when, when do we, do we expect that during the Windows 10 out? You know, when it's. That's out? when I expect it. Yeah. This is just a guess. This is not based on any inside information, but. When you want to make a device that is, uh, you know, think about what Surface does. Think about the very first way that they described the original Surface devices back three years ago-ish. You know, this was a, a way for Windows 8 at the time to shine. It was, a, it was a physical manifestation of everything that was Windows 8, right? Um, and that's what Surface Pro 4 will be for Windows 10, I think. Um, it will have a modern processor chipset, all that kind of stuff. It will be a full PC. It will be a tablet that can be a PC, obviously, with a type cover, hopefully a new improved type cover. But, but the Windows 10 specific thing, you know, when it's a, a physical platform on which Windows 10 will shine. You know, we talked, uh, you and I did, when you asked me about Surface 3 being, you know, for Windows 10. Surface Pro 4, I think, is the one that's for Windows 10. It's the one that will have the biometric stuff so that you can log in with your uh, eyeball or with your face. You know, it, can do, it will have that kind of a camera. Uh, I think that's the type of thing you're going to see in Surface Pro 4. So same form factor, but some features that are just very specific to Windows 10. Do you think the timing of this release had a, had something to do with, you know, Apple releasing a new Macs, the new MacBooks? Nothing. Nope. Okay. Yeah, nothing. No, and, and that's the thing. You know, uh, Microsoft is, uh, it's not like uh, USB-C was like this surprise to Microsoft. Um, they, uh, I'm sure we're actually well aware that Apple was developing that machine and that they had you know, uh, we're partnering with Intel and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, Google, same thing with the Pixel. But that's not, you know, Surface Pro 4, will it have USB-C? Um, I don't know. Honestly, I'm not sure pragmatically that that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'd rather have Surface Pro 4 have an extra USB 3 port on it, frankly. Um, oh, yeah. I, I mean, but, but where does USB 3 really make, uh, USB-C really make sense, you know, like other than I, there's no reason to do it. No, there's no, you know, it's not compatible with a single peripheral that any potential Surface Pro 4 user owns. So who yeah. cares? I mean, if that's how they do uh, charging on that device, that's fine. You know, um, one thing, one little nifty thing about the Surface 3, by the way, which I think will carry over in some capacity uh, to Surface Pro 4, however they choose to do it, is that, that there's a, it does charging over micro USB, which is the same form, you, you know, the form factor we have on phones and so forth. Um, Microsoft supplies, I think it's a 13 watt power adapter for the device that obviously charge the things, you know, charge the thing full speed. But if you have a phone adapter or a, one from your tablet or whatever, it will work too. And that's the difference between USB-C and, U and micro USB. Yeah. USB-C is like kind of the hot newness and oh look, Apple did it. It's going to be on this gold laptop. It's really high end and exciting. That's nice, but nobody has USB-C anywhere. But I mean, you still need a dongle. I mean, that's the whole point. You, you still need, need a dongle, but everyone has micro USB. So when you buy a Surface 3, you, you already have cables everywhere that work with it. You don't have to bring your charger anywhere. You'll always have a charger for it, no matter where you go. Okay, here, here's and, a dumb question, though, Paul. Yeah. Um, that micro USB on the Surface for charging, yes. mm -hmm. does that also work for data? Yes, oh, that's what I was, that was my uh, ultimate point. Okay. Actually, that's the interesting thing about it, and I think that's how they get a second USB port on Surface Pro 4. I don't know what form it's going to take. Full-size USB, micro-USB, USB-C, I have no idea. I don't know anything about Surface Pro 4. But when you look at the micro-USB port on Surface 3 and realize that it can be used for data as well, it's almost as useless as having USB-C because, frankly, no one has a micro-USB cable that's micro-USB on either end or whatever. Wait, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. but what, what's, the, um, what's the transfer? Like, what's the, uh, the speed, the bandwidth on micro-USB compared to USB-C? I'm, so, I'm sure USB-C yeah, is going to be a lot faster. It's USB 2. It's so USB it's not. Two. Okay. It's, yeah, and that's the difference. Yeah. USB uh, C is USB three. Yeah, it's just a small. Version. So it's fuller speed, uh, fuller, faster speed. Um, now uh, we could only. We, we, I'm guessing. I mean, I'm just and like anyone else yeah. who doesn't know anything about this, you could only guess. But my guess is that on Surface Pro four, Microsoft could elect to continue with the magnetic charger thing they've already done. Uh, there are reasons to do that for docking. And frankly, the dock on the uh, the Surface the in fact, now that I've talked myself out of this, I'm, I'm going to just stop talking because actually 
as I just explained. I think we both talked yourself out of the Well, whole. no, no, you have to. So we can only guess. But see, actually, now as yeah. I'm talking myself through it, they can't go USB power on US on Surface Pro 4 because this thing has to, that thing has to work with this dock. And this dock works through the power port that is magnetic. That is a magnetic one. It has to use that same power port. So forget everything I just said. Okay. That's how we know what's going to happen there. So See, that's, that's what yeah. happens when you do a show live. You think it through and then you come up with the conclusion at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so totally I, that everything. said, I mean, look, I mean, uh, I can't really bring this over here in the dock to you. But if you look at this side of a of a Surface Pro 3, um, the dock goes to about here. And there's space up here. I mean, there's a there's a volume toggle here, but there's room on there for a little port, you know. And there's room over here too. I would say, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, you know, up here as well. I mean, there's no reason you couldn't add a micro USB, a USB C, or whatever. And I I really do think that for a pro device, one of the expectations is for there to be more um, expansion, you know, on the device yeah. itself. And so I I do still hope to see. I'd like to see two USB three ports. Frankly, I think that would be the. I mean, I don't know why they wouldn't. You know, like just put two of them on, and it, it there's there's a lot happening. I mean, there's a, there's a lot happening with this device. There's a lot of questions about this device, and then plus the four, and then how how it's going to be with Windows ten. Um, I mean, wouldn't they come up with a revised version of? So okay, here's here's another one. Now now that we're talking out loud and thinking about this, when the Pro four is announced. Are they going to also announce a regular Surface 4? So, right. <laughs> right, because because then one is compatible. Um, you know, one has all, like, the Windows 10 specs, and the other one doesn't. And you're a version behind on one. Right. So I would imagine they would do an updated version of this in a couple of months and drop or, the price on this. Or this is how they split it. I mean, they don't have to launch both at the same time. You know, maybe... If you think about six months from now is Windows 10, six months from then is Surface 4, you know. Maybe they leapfrog each other a little bit. I don't know. I, I really don't know anything about any future Surface products. So It's a cool, I mean, it's a beautiful device. Um, you know, I have, I have a friend that just bought a laptop and he was looking at the Surface, but he didn't get it for, I guess, the pricing reasons. But he ended up getting, you know, like a convertible. I think he did. He, I think he got the Yoga. Uh, the mm -hmm. Yoga 11. And he likes it. He's fine with it. But, you know, there are a couple things that he's not crazy about that he wanted with the Surface. Mm -hmm. So he compromised by getting it due to the price. But I think for someone like him, this would be a great device because guess what? It's much cheaper. It's four ninety nine, So it's going to cost you, you know, 700 bucks at the end of the day. But I, it's still far yeah, cheaper. I think, I think this is, I would say... The big market for this is probably going to be students, you know, because obviously, I mean, you could spend three hundred bucks and get a Chromebook or something. Um, Which they you could just spend announced. Bucks and get a cheap Windows laptop. They just announced but, new Chromebooks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you could, but you know, I, I still think that ability to handwrite on the device is something that students are going to be really into, and. Um, it's a full PC. I mean, it's got that thing. It's not, you know, Chromebook is, you know, it's cute for some things, but it, it ultimately you come up against the limitations of this browser thing. And, uh, you know, Windows is a full powered, modern uh, and mature operating system. And it has lots of great apps. You get a free subscription to Office 365 for the first year. One note is free regardless. Um, it's a cool solution. Okay, so let's play devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at this Asus Chromebook Flip. So it's a convertible from, uh, Chromebook, two forty nine. Yep. The keyboard looks like a Mac. I'm sure the trackpad feels like you know, like every other trackpad on the market. Uh, two hundred forty nine dollars. Why would I, I? I, I, if all I'm going to do is use this for school, what's going to prevent me from buying this? Is it the fact that I don't? Is it the fact that it's it's a Chromebook? I'm I'm curious if that's how people are thinking. Like, are they yeah, yeah. like for me? I wouldn't buy well, it I, because it, you're going to be limited. But for most people, they're already yeah. using their phone as their main I'm device. A, uh, sure, but I'm talking about students in particular. Or kids yeah, yeah I'm talking about I'm talking about students. So too, as a so, student, all right. So you're you're sending Susie off to school, right? Or maybe Susie is at home going to elementary school. It doesn't really matter. Um, Chromebook is is an option, 
you know, and, and honestly, around a school campus and at home, you're going to have Wi-Fi all the time. I mean, the offline argument against Chromebook doesn't really yeah, yeah. factor into the situation. It, it really is. It's, it's two halves of an equation. On the one hand, you can make the argument, and it's correct to make, that Chromebook is simpler, and it absolutely is. And that, you know, it has the basic stuff online and, and through the web that you can do, and it works well in, in certain circumstances. It's all true. You know, Windows, on the other hand, is a lot more powerful. Office is awesome. Full experience. It's also more complex, you know, and that's absolutely true to point out as well. And so where you fall on this spectrum is going to depend on your experiences in life and what you're used to and what you expect. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to say either one is the better decision, but I am going to tell you I would never buy my child a Chromebook. No, <laughs> so, see, I, I mean, but you know, I wouldn't either. But, but you know, if yeah. I, I was reading this article and it was interesting and they go, kids really. And the point of the article was this. And, you know, he was it was a little one sided, but. It was kind of true. He goes, kids really don't care about performance. All they care about is, will this YouTube video play in HD? Yeah. And can I chat at the same time? And you know what? That he has a point. Sure. That's really what my, it really my, comes my, down I, to I, for a lot of people. I don't monitor my daughter's uh, computer usage. But I suspect, actually, she does a lot of this on an iPad, too. But as far as actual, she cracks open the laptop, and she uses Windows 7, and she... She writes uh, papers and things for school in Word, and she does PowerPoint presentations, yeah. which is a little borderline child abuse. <laughs> um, you know, that's all fine. I mean, I, I could she do that kind of stuff on a Chromebook? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. I mean, could she do it on a way more expensive MacBook Air? Absolutely. Yeah. But we're not rich, and she's not doing that. And, you know, people are wherever they are in life, and you make decisions based on all kinds of different things. Um, some people perceive the value in a thousand dollar, or I guess it's now a nine hundred dollar Apple laptop, and they'll say, "Well, that's what little Susie is getting." And some other people say, "I can't afford that." Uh, you know, there's a one hundred and fifty or two hundred dollar Chromebook, or maybe a little Windows laptop like an HP Stream Eleven. Maybe you get that instead. And 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 I think these things are all hitting at this. At least those low end ones are all hitting at the same yeah. part of the market. The Surface Three is right in the middle, and it's a lot closer to that MacBook Air. And so when you want to, you know, if you think about specking out a, a Surface 3 with a type cover and, a, a, you know, a pen, um, you could you could get up to MacBook Air territory. And so now you have a kind of a different conversation because the prices are close. And does the multi-touch slash tablet nature of the Surface 3 balance out? Because on the Apple side, you'd also have to buy a, a, an iPad. To get the tablet part of it, and the iPad's really expensive. This another five, six hundred bucks. It's it's a weird time because there's so many different options right now, and I, I would have said, well, if you want if you want the easiest and the most familiar thing, get a Windows machine because that's what everybody's familiar with. Everybody uses a Windows machine at home, and ninety something percent of the the market is Windows, and that's what you know. But if you're a twelve year old and you need a computer, I spill water all it's okay. <clears throat> sorry, it's I can't okay. drink. If you're a 12 year old and you know it's time for you to get a laptop, do you mm -hmm. really care that it's Windows? Probably not. No, unless uh, unless you're gaming, I mean, you know, unless uh, sure, but sure, that sure, that's sure. a small group pe group of people. Also, do you care that it's a Windows machine because you get to do your word processing on there? Your search engine is Google anyway. You're going on Facebook. You're uh, you're you're opening up YouTube, and that's it. And you got docs. Well, it's not. A, it's not a matter of caring. I don't think in a lot of cases the kid has much say in the purchase. Um, and by the way, I mean, unfortunately, the way education is going these days uh, in the United States, anyway, the way this really happens at, at, in school is that the school system has purchased laptops or or iPads or Chromebooks, and they make you pay for them. Yeah. Uh, and they're rented out to the kids or whatever for the year, and then they give them back at the end of the year or the end of some term of time. Um, and so sometimes you don't really get it, you know, to make that decision. But I, Surface Three is not. I, I don't expect Dedham High School to roll out Surface Threes to the kids. These things cost eight hundred bucks a piece when you really spec. No, this them is out. when you're going for back. You know, you're this going, to back, going to back to school, and then you, you see this and it says four ninety nine or five ninety nine. Well, you're going to college though. In yeah. other words, so I'm sending my son to college uh, not this year, uh, but next year, I guess if he's lucky. He's not. <laughs> we'll see how it does. But. Um, you know, would I feel comfortable sending him off with a Surface 3 if it was this year? Yeah. Would I expect that that Surface 3 would last him through an estimated four years of school or knowing him, six years of school? Um, 
actually, I'm not sure about that. I don't know. I, we, I don't know. I, I haven't had, so I don't have one. I can't, I, I feel weird making bald statements about this thing, but um, Adam processor four years from now, I don't know. I don't know. Um, so we, we need to evaluate this thing before we can make a lot of general statements. But I think a real PC, the theory is that this thing would get you through college. Whereas, yeah. um, you know, would an iPad get you through college, even if you added a keyboard? Probably not. Would a MacBook yeah. Air? Absolutely. Would a Chromebook? Probably not. Sure. Um, but, you know. But, you know, this kind of goes back into back around to what we were talking about last last week about how Microsoft has to kind of become the service company rather than mm -hmm. relying on selling Windows and selling Office. Because mm -hmm. think about it. I mean, a Chromebook, for, for as silly as it sounds, it is serious competition for Microsoft. And it's a serious threat. Well, it's yes. taken away from their ecosystem. Uh all these devices, all these crappy Android tablets, all these, uh, all the phones that Samsung is putting out, everything Apple is doing, this is competition <laughs> yeah. for the this, desktop. Yeah. And it's taking away from the desktop. It's taking away from my, what Microsoft is doing. So in yeah. order to kind of grip and hold these people, you have to put your con you have to put your products on every other, uh, other platform. Right. I mean, I, I, it's just I mean, the future of it. There are certain markets, you know, uh, Apple sold but something like 75 million iPhones in the fourth quarter of 2014. Um, there's nothing Microsoft can do about that. On the good news front, that doesn't impact the market we're talking about right now because every one of those people has to have a computer of some kind if they're in school. You know, so they're not going to be doing their homework on an iPhone 6 Plus. So this is an important market for them because, like you said, you know, Chromebooks in particular are eating away at their share at the low end, which you know, when you th when you think about the PC market of a couple of years ago, it was Windows on the low end, and it was like the low end being eighty percent of the market, and then Mac on the high end. But now you've got someone eating away at that, like maybe twenty to twenty five percent of the low end. You get Apple eating away at twenty to twenty five percent of the high end, and you're kind of stuck in the, this no no man's land in the yeah. middle. Um, when you can buy perfectly good computers for two hundred bucks, three hundred bucks, you're going to sell a lot of computers in that price range. You're not going to sell a lot of six hundred dollar computers. Eight hundred dollar computers, and once you get to nine hundred thousand, you start looking at Macs. You know, so that's the you know because that's Macs the are problem. pretty, and that's what people that's what well, people they, say. No, yeah. because people have no, I, rightfully so. There's nothing. I, look, I don't personally like Mac OS ten, but the hardware is beautiful, and it's understandable that someone who's had a good experience over time with an iPod, an iPhone, an iPad, is going to the Apple Store and, and eyeballing those machines. And if you're a parent and you're all doing iPhones and Time to send Susie off to college. I mean, maybe a MacBook Air is the way you go because you trust the brand and you think they're high quality and you're going to pay a little bit extra, but yeah. it will get you through school. It's, it's, it's interesting. And then this leaves Windows Phone. And, you know, what happens with <laughs> Windows Phone, yeah. really? Because, you know, we're talking about why would someone go and buy a Chromebook, right? We talked about that. We said that. Why would someone go buy a Mac? Well, the pricing, once you get to a certain level, you look at a Mac yeah. because they're good looking and it's good hardware. Well, okay, so why would someone go into Verizon or AT&T and buy a Windows phone unless you really like Windows? <laughs> well, I, okay. I mean... I don't know that people are going into an AT and store, AT and T store, and buying anything Windows, but <laughs> I, I think that Windows Phone is addressing that same low end of the market that Chromebook is yeah. addressing. But and it's phones. doing well. And I mean, it's doing decent in that, in that market in certain places. Yeah. yeah, that's there's not actually a huge market for that kind of device in the United States. That's the problem. I would, I mean, I don't have any data to support this, but I would imagine that a lot of the low end phones that are sold in the United States, low end Windows phones, are in fact second phones. Burner phones that are used because your on contract phone is wrecked and you can't repair it because it's too expensive. I thought you were going to say drug deals. No, no, I don't mean <laughs> for drug. Yeah, I mean Windows Phone is the preferred choice of drug dealers, as you know. <laughs> no, I don't mean it like that. But I mean, um, you know, I don't think. I don't mean to say there aren't poor people in the United States. Of course, there are. But I mean, I they're going to buy low end, you know, Android, Android phones. Yeah. And, and, and in this country, a low end Android phone means you buy a last year's S4 or something instead of an S5 or you buy, you know, whatever. It's a very like specific a, market, but, I, and I said this, you know, every time we talk about this, when I went to Mexico, almost every phone that I saw was a Windows phone. Why? Because they're inexpensive and, and people, a lot of people are doing prepaid phones um, and they're not signing on to contracts. And it's a great example of, of it doing well in that market. But when yeah. you have, you know, the higher end Lumias, you, it, it's a very difficult thing for them to do as far as competing with an S6, 
an iPhone 6 and, you know, putting the Lumia whatever version is their flagship in that mix, it's right. very difficult for them. And I don't know how they can penetrate that market if they ever can even take a dent out of it. I don't think they can. The lower end is is really what does it for them. You spend 49 bucks and you got a Windows phone. Yeah. And, 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 you know, in that price range, under 100 bucks, um, a Windows phone is a great phone. It really is. You know, it's great. Um, I happen to think that when his phone works great on high-end phones as well, the problem is they're not really selling any. So um, it doesn't really matter what I think, I guess. But yeah, I mean, it, you know, everyone knows about iPhone. Everyone knows about Samsung. That's kind of the end of the story, at least here in the United States. But why isn't, you know, why wouldn't it sell? Is it that the market is mature to the point that they can't even get a piece of it at this point? Or is it is it the Windows name? I mean, let's just put that out there. Do people just know? I, we can't. In the minutes we have left in the show, there's no way to fully explore this topic. I mean, I think the simplest way to say it is that part of it is definitely the app gap thing, which is a real problem. Um, part of it is that even though Microsoft did a really good job of differentiating the phone, the flip side to that means it's also really kind of different from other phones, although they're rectifying that now. Um, and when you pick one up, it's not immediately obvious. You know, it's just not a it's not a grid of you know, icons that you tap and an app launches. I mean, you can do that, but that's not really how it was designed originally. It looks different, you know? Oh, this is what I was going to ask you. Uh, what do you think of the Chrome bit? <laughs> well, I mean, I don't know anything about it uh, other than that it's, uh, I, I assume it's a, uh, an HDMI dongle. Um, yeah. hundred bucks, plug it into a s display and it's got Chrome OS on it, right? So I, I've, <laughs> I mean, I kind of question the point of Chrome OS on almost anything, Obviously, Chromebooks have kind of taken off with consumers and with schools, but other Chrome devices haven't. And I don't mean, uh, obviously, um, Chromecast has, but Chromecast isn't really a Chrome device. Um, Chrome boxes have not really sold. Those are the PC style Chrome OS devices. And then this thing is like Chrome OS on a stick. And so I, I don't know. I don't really see a huge need for this. Is this just, I mean, uh, and we'll probably run great on that hardware. It's you know, but why not? My headphones falling out. For a hundred bucks, for fifty bucks, you get a laptop. You know, you could get yeah. a you get a Chromebook laptop. So well, this might be. I, look, I, I'm just trying to imagine. Like, you're not going to see these in corporate boardrooms, but maybe in a school where they have a big display in each classroom, you can plug this thing in. I mean, frankly, I, you'd be better off buying a Chromecast and casting a Chromebook screen to it. Yeah. But. I don't know. I don't know. Like why I get, they're throwing everything at the wall. And then they I they announced two other computers. Uh, what is it? The hair? Is that yeah. how you say it? Hair? I don't know. Higher or whatever. Higher. Yeah. $150. High cents and higher, yeah. 150 yeah. bucks at Walmart and, and, and uh, Amazon. And then there's a flip around convertible device with a touch screen, right? Which is a lot like what we see in the Windows thing. And this is why I think, you know, Chrome and its partners, which by the way are the same partners Microsoft has on PCs for the most yeah. part, are really... Um, going after the whole market of devices that Windows 10 is targeting as well. And so they're going to, I mean, they're really seeing a competitive push at every possible step along the way. I mean, to the point that I'm, I'm looking at this picture that you have on your website, um, yeah. the Pixel, the new Pixel. Yeah. And even in their like press photo, like you see like the little start button on the side. Like I'm going to pull let it up. Me, here. Let uh, see. Let's see. Like right here, like right there. Oh yeah. You the little start button. That It does not look like the flag. The Windows the flag. flag? Oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that that looks like Windows to me. So I think that's the like the Google launcher yeah. uh thing. Like I'm trying to think where you would see that online. Like Google They have it on the website. I mean, if if I'm looking at this, like I wouldn't know that there's a difference. Well, that's the point. I mean yeah. it looks like Windows seven, right? It yeah, looks exactly smart. like Windows seven. Yeah. It's it's I don't it's know. It's insidious. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I, in the same way that you kind of want to resent it, uh, you have to give them a little credit. It's smart, you know. It's smart, and people are going to buy this, you know. And, and I, I, they're probably going to sell a lot of these for back to school. It's just, I wonder once you buy it and you use it for a little bit, what the overall reaction is. Like, I don't know. I know a lot of people that are fans of it, but it's not their daily computer. Like, I don't know anybody that's using this as their daily, like, this is what they'd use. They use a Chromebook, and that's it. They don't care about anything else. This, this is, is the, like a secondary. They should give this to prisoners. <laughs> yes, you know, I don't even, yeah. I don't understand the market for this stuff. 
it, it's uh, the people that are in a browser all day long, which is most people. I think that's really the market for them. That they're hoping that they're going to bank on the people that really don't want to spend the money and they, they're in a browser anyway, so they don't really care about having apps and having Skype. You know, like you can't use Skype, but you got Google Hangouts, which everybody else has. It's a yeah. weird. It's a weird thing. I mean, it, it's that we're relying on these ecosystems so much. You know, we were talking about why Microsoft isn't doing uh, the as far as we know right now. They're not. You can't send text messages to Windows. Right. We were talking about that. You can on Apple and you can on, I believe you're going to be able to do it on the Chromebooks also. I, you may be able to do it now. I don't know. But it was, you know, they had announced it a while ago. But, and I got so many messages from people saying like, well, you could do it if you use this app, right? Like it's like this weird routing thing that they do. Uh, and Verizon has their own messaging app where it takes your text messages and it forwards it to your phone. Uh, it forwards it to your laptop. You know, it's, a, it's an application you're running. But it doesn't really work well. Right. So it, it's you're still like in different ecosystems. You know, you need yeah. this app and it needs to work and it maybe doesn't work. And it, it, it's a weird bubble we're in where it does like 50 different applications do the same exact thing. And everybody's using something <laughs> different. Yeah, it, it will eventually consolidate down. But yeah, that's <laughs> I needed different. someone's information to go. Do you use kick? I go, well, I don't know. Why? <laughs> right. Right. What is it? Why? <laughs> you know? Yeah, you know, they were they were younger, and I'm like, why would I use that? I could just send you a text message. I'm, like, they go, do you have i? I'm like, I go, do you have i message? He goes, yeah, but I don't use that. I use Kick because it's cool. Well, Paul, we got to get with the times. We got to start kicking each other. That's what they use kicking each other? Yeah, this is that's sounds so violent. Uh, let's talk about Spartan a little bit. You got your uh, your hands on it. It was released a couple yep. days ago. Uh, what do you think? I mean, it's it's early days, but um, it looks good. I mean, it, it's it's funny when you think about browsers on Windows in particular right now. Obviously, you know, Internet Explorer is kind of the big chunk of the market. Um, it, it's it's really kind of garbagey. I mean, it's it's unreliable. Uh, it's amazing to me how often it crashes on my computer. As soon as Windows eight one, it's Windows ten. It doesn't matter. Uh, and then there's Chrome, which I really like because I like the interface. It's very streamlined, especially when you pin apps to the taskbar. It really gets – Chrome gets out of the way. It's really about the web app. I like that. Uh, it's very extensible, lots of add-ins. But it's also really big and heavy, and it consumes a lot of resources. And if you're ever running out of RAM on Windows, I mean, that's why. It's Chrome. It's always Chrome. It's crazy, like, I, I mean, how bad it can get in that way. And so Project Spartan is an attempt by Microsoft to kind of cut the difference between the two where – it's built into the OS like IE was. It has some of the advantages, hardware acceleration and so forth. It's a modern browser, more like Chrome than IE. It's got that uh, minimalistic kind of UI like Chrome does. And it's extensible like Chrome is, or it will be. It's not right now, but um, that's the plan. And it looks good. I mean, it's, it's, it doesn't have everything. It's not all there. Um, there's some things don't work uh, as you would expect them to. Um, and it has some kind of unique new features as well. You can do web annotations, like uh, which you know makes more sense if you have a pen, but most people don't. But uh, offline reading, uh, reading, you know, reading mode, a reading view, I guess they call it, uh, which is a lot like the reading view in Internet Explorer, uh, the modern version. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, it, I think the problem they're going to face is mobile because one of the things that is really attractive about Chrome, if you use Android devices with Windows or with Chrome OS, God forbid, or whatever, or the Mac, or if you use a Mac and an iOS device like an iPhone uh, and have Safari, is all the things you do when each browser kind of translate across to the mobile version. So your favorites come across, your bookmarks, your settings come across. Um, you can start doing something in the mobile version, pick it up on the desktop or vice versa. And so Project Spartan will do that, but you have to, ha not only does it have to be Windows, but it has to be Windows 10. So if you have Project Spartan on your desktop computer in Windows 10 and you have a Windows Phone 8 device and you want to go out in the world and you already started like a map search or whatever in Maps, that's not coming over to – well, yeah. actually, that's a bad example because that's Maps. But you already start – you know, you did – you saved something for offline viewing or whatever. Now you want to read it on the train on your Windows Phone. Uh, it's not there because you don't have Project Spartan on that phone. And so have you, um, that's a problem. Have you found any compatibility issues right now with websites? Yeah, I mean, the only one that was uh, kind of humorous, which is uh, I noticed when I did a browser speed test that it identified itself as Chrome. 
right? Oh, that is fun. So I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. And I have, if you've ever visited Google sites with um, I, Internet Explorer, uh, you'll, you'll notice that there are some compatibility issues. It doesn't let you do certain things, especially around Google Plus. And so I thought, well, I'll go to Google Plus and see what happens. And it had no, Google Plus had no idea what the browser was. And it basically said, you need to get a new version of Chrome, i.e. Uh, Firefox or Safari. Oh, you can pick any out. one of those, go for it. Um, and so I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. And so I think that improves over time. I think that's something they want to get right. But Sure. Yeah, so far so good. Yeah, it, it's you're right about Chrome, though, being totally bloated at this point. And yeah. it's funny because that was their... It, they were the total opposite, and that's why a lot of people went over to them because they weren't bloated and they were quick and they were fast and yeah. were better than I. Part of it, part of it might be user error. I mean, I know in my part, I have probably bloated this thing down with too many add-ons, and I need to maybe be a little more. <laughs> so smart that's another about thing. That. How are they going to go about extensions? Uh, so that's not available in this build. It's not really clear. Yeah. There are no extensions to play with. But you know, Adobe Flash is built in, and you can toggle it off if you want to do that. Um, but the goal is for it to support. Um, add-ons as does chrome i mean internet explorer actually does have an add-in system it's just not very hokey and or it is hokey and they, they really haven't um you know ever kind of had a store you know like there's a chrome store that you can go to and look for add-ins and things like that and and you can really load that thing up um, yeah and that's not the way it is naive the other thing is okay so i get windows 10 i buy this laptop and i want to go search the web i'm going to mm -hmm. see this new thing here whatever they're going to call it right um that's what that's what's going to be defaulted on my right. desktop ie is going to be somewhere else it's in there it's it's installed it's installed but it's not going to be front it's and center it's not pinned to the taskbar yeah i mean um, well you know if you upgrade obviously windows will respect whatever you had pinned and so if you were if you had ie and that was your default browser that will be the case that will be the case too. there um i'm just i'm wondering if people are going to get a little confused and they're going to say well where's ie yeah i mean uh, the icon they have for this thing is not probably the final icon i hope not it's terrible looking but what's the icon uh, right now it looks like a glo it's a stylized globe you know which okay. in, i've joked is sort of like the internet icon they used to have remember in windows 95 it was like a globe um it's uh, yeah it doesn't look like any <laughs> i don't know so we'll see i don't we'll see how that goes it's not like a like a helmet like a trojan no a lot of people uh you know look at the windows 10 desktop and they're like why which where how do i find this thing and it's like look for the icon you don't recognize and click that oh, yeah that is a weird icon <laughs> yeah. it's like this really flat globe yeah, yeah it's like a wireframe globe yeah or something. um i mean the engine is is a is a you know, it's going to be quick regardless because the platform is a quick platform it's based on. But I I get they have to do this. I mean, this was a necessary thing for them to do because the IE brand was kind of hurting. But I'm curious on what they call this thing. Yep. Yeah. Have you used Cortana in it? Yeah. How, yeah. how did it work? It's okay. <laughs> it's, you know. It's okay. It's um. I'm trying to remember now if the voice thing I did. I guess that wouldn't have been in the browser, but most of the Cortana stuff I've done in this build, I've done. I've been playing with the voice, like "Hey Cortana," uh, which you know the you it kicks up, but actually that kicks up out of the taskbar, not in the browser. Yeah, I mean a lot of that. Um, let me bring something up so I can um, let me find an example of this. Like if you go to actually maybe this is a good example. If you just like if you you can select text, right? So I'm trying. I'm trying to bring up something that makes sense. Um, yeah, let me see what this does. You can select text, and when you do, one of the options that's in the drop, you know, the pop-up menu is Ask Cortana. And what happens is a, a pane appears in the browser window, and it tries to find information about that thing. And so, actually, that was a bad example. Let me, let me find a. I'll just do like a web search for like Paris, you know. And so, you have like a Paris Wikipedia page or something that you're maybe you're reading a story in the New York Times, and they mention Paris. You're like, I want to know more about Paris, you know. So you right click on the word Paris and ask Cortana, and then it comes up. And it's it's actually kind of pretty. There's like a picture of Paris, there's a map of Paris, a little summary of what Paris is, there's a link to Wikipedia, but then they have information about it: local time, the population, the area, travel tips, nearby airports, colleges, and universities, the weather, points of interest, you know, things other cities people search for. And it's all kind of in this pain. And I think the point of it isn't just to kind of jam the Cortana brand on your throat, although actually I think that is part of it. But it, it's a lot of time. It's it's sort of a recognition of what people do and how they work. And if you think about it, you know, like how would you do this today? Like you're reading a New York Times article in your browser, 
and you want to look something up, like you would, you would copy it, right? Yeah. Probably. And then you'd open a new tab and then you paste in the word and you do like a search and then you'd, you know, you'd have to go back and forth. And I think the thing that's nice about this is that the pane appears right in the browser window and you don't have to context shift. It's not like another thing. Okay, so if I'm reading something and your name comes up and I ask Cortana who you are, it'll like yeah. I guess it'll come up like a little window on the side. Yeah. With the information. Yep. Oh, that's actually yep. pretty helpful. Yeah, that's interesting. That's actually pretty helpful. Yeah, actually. Um, let's see. I'm looking here. Um, <laughs> Paul Thorat, official site. <laughs> Paul Thorat. <laughs> who funny. is Paul Thorat? It says, here's what I found. Paul yeah. Thorat, author. Paul Brian Thorat is a technology podcaster, published author, and blogger on his website, Thorat.com. He regularly writes hard art, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, and where's he gathering that info? Wikipedia? Wikipedia, it looks like. It's, it tells you that my wife's name is Stephanie Thorat, which is a little alarming. Um, it has written works, it has pictures of some of my books. It has people also search for Mary Jo Foley. Um, yeah, so I've got a little information in there that's a little weird, <laughs> but, yeah, but okay. I don't know why anyone would know anything about me, but it is there. And then, um, you know, I, I'm, what else? I'm trying to think what other types of things. I guess like, uh, I don't know, like recipes are probably kind of a big one, um, you know, where you, you want to maybe you want to know something about food, I suppose. It will probably do foreign language translation. I haven't, I haven't actually tried that. Um, but the point is the types of things you would search, like an, you're doing something and you want to know more, you typically go and open a new tab or a new browser window, and this is letting you do it right in there. And then you kind of can, you can leave it open and reference it as you go, or you can just close it and keep going and doing what you're doing, but you don't have to, um, you know, you don't have to do it yourself. It just happens in the browser for you. Yeah. It's that interesting. Cool. I'm, yeah. I'm on Bing right now. I'm just playing around with it and I just put in who is Paul Thorat and pulled up. Um, well, the other thing I, I just, I mean, again, this is just kind of a UI thing, but um, uh, Cortana is obviously built into the, U, uh, the OS and it's built into Windows Phone as well, soon to be Windows 10 Mobile. And the display of this information is consistent with the way it looks on phone because it's kind of a, you know, like a thin pane. So it would fit within a phone. And it looks like the Cortana interface that's built into the taskbar as well. And so it's, you know, if, if I go to, like I looked up Disneyland, for example, if I go to the Cortana thing that's built into um, and now it's all screwed up. <laughs> it's built into the OS. I was going to say it should it should look kind of like the same thing. So see. I just I just searched who is Andrew Zarian, right? And then I went mm -hmm. to images and this is what comes up. The first like recommended search. Andrew Zarian wife. Andrew and Jessica Zarian, Andrew Zarian GFK Network, what the tech? Andrew Zarian blowout, Andrew Zarian blowout. hair transplant, Andrew Zarian mogul. Wow. I mean, these are the things that come up. But I like that the first two are my wife. Sure. And of all, the, and then hair transplant because it's obviously, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it makes all the sense in the world. Um, right. It's interesting though. I actually like Bing. Why wouldn't you, why wouldn't people use Bing? Yeah, people are used to what they used to. You know what? Your your first recommended search, Stephanie Thorat. Is it? Yeah. In Bing, so they always go for the better half. I think so. <laughs> they know. <laughs> it's, probably, it's probably wise. They know. That's actually really funny how it does that. Really I'm trying to make this thing work. Okay, I think I got this now. So I'm sorry. Now I'm just curious how, how this differs from the... But in Cort Cortana is going to be integrated throughout Windows. So if any point I could ask Cortana, is it going to pop up Spartan or is it going to be like their own little... You know, if I... If, if, well, in okay. Right. So um, the Cortana that's built into the OS will provide some information in its own pane. And if you go to look for more information, that's going to load in whatever your default browser yeah. is. So actually... It could load in IE. It could load in Chrome. You know, it depends on what you've set up. Um, obviously, when you do it from within Cortana, I'm sorry, within uh, Project Spartan, you stay in Spartan. It, you know, once you're okay, so that was my question. So it doesn't ever go anywhere else. Okay, so it, I'm in I'm in Spartan right now, and I ask Cortana a question. Right. Okay. If I wasn't in Spartan, it would have like its own thing that comes up. Yeah. Right with the answer, and then if I want more, I click on yeah, it, and then so, it opens up okay. my browser. So if I'm in Spartan and I ask Cortana a question, is it going to pull it up in Bing or is it going to uh, in Bing? Is it going to pull it up in Spartan or is it going to pull it up uh, on its own? And then 
Did no, that make sense? It depends, it depends on what it is. So, okay. and it depends on where you are. It depends on what browsers you have set up. I mean, so if you're doing it from the OS, if it can answer it in line, it will. Like you can type in things like weather. And you get this kind of neat display. It says, here's the weather now. Here's the weather for the week. Uh, you can choose to show weather updates for this city. Uh, and when you click on that, da, 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 it doesn't go anywhere. It stays there. And then you can search your stuff, which is your own documents and stuff on your hard drive. And you can search the web. And if you click on search the web, in this case, actually Internet Explorer comes up with Bing. And it goes to searches for weather on Bing, right? Yeah. So it's in a full browser window. If you are in Project Spartan, actually, this is kind of a special feature it has. And you type in weather. It will actually, it's funny because it, uh, if you hit enter, it goes to Bing. But if you don't hit enter, if you just leave it sitting there, and actually I think you have to have a question mark in the front. Um, it has, it can help if I could spell weather. Um, <laughs> it has a nice inline display that drops down from the address bar. So it says, here's the, re here's the weather right now in Dedham, Massachusetts, 48 degrees and cloudy. And it's just in the, in, in, you know, I don't have to go anywhere. You know, I'm, I'm here. I could probably type in like a stock quote like MSFT. Yeah. And sure enough, it says I've got the latest stock quote for Microsoft Corporation, forty dollars sixty six down twenty nine cents. Um, I, okay, I here's, haven't left. Here's you know, another like question I'm, for you. Yeah. Uh, and someone's asking, and then we got to wrap up. Um, I just got a message asking, what are they doing with social media, social networking integration within Windows itself? Is there, is yeah. there anything new with that? So uh, the People app has been the way that that's happened in Windows. Um, right now, the People app that's in Windows 10 technical preview is the same one from Windows 8.1, so we haven't seen how that's going to change. But People is part of the Outlook suite of apps. You know, Mail is another part, yeah. Calendar is another part. Those things will be updated over time. They just haven't been yet, so we're not really sure. Okay. Didn't know if that, <laughs> that was changed or not. No, not yet. Yeah. I just want, I want, you know, remember those, um, what do they call the the like the modifying for Windows desktop? Like what were they called? What was the big one? Rain something. Say again. The what was that thing that like modified your your desktop, your theme? Like you could customize oh, everything. Oh, talking about like Rainmaker or Rainmaker, something. Rainmaker, yeah. Like I want one um, where it's just your tweets, just like constantly coming oh. up. Oh, that's what I want. Paul Thorat's tweets. It's like a like a Stardock utility. Yeah, like Stardock. That's gonna be interesting. How that's gonna play? Yeah. You know, play a part in this. A lot, a lot of stuff happening. All right, Paul, let's wrap it up. Uh, go to our website, gfknetwork.com. Of course, all things Paul Thorat, uh, Thorat.com. I'm having a problem. I'm looking at the IRC, and I'm not getting anything. And this computer across from me, I have no, nothing is pulling up. No websites. Hmm. Um, You're having technical issues. Yeah, I think they're having a DNS problem again. Rise has been having a lot of issues. Uh, go to our website, gfknetwork.com. Guys, you can follow me on Twitter, at Andrew Zarin. Of course, you can follow Paul, at the Rot. A uh, little Windows talk today, Paul. We did a lot of Windows talk. Next yeah. week, we won't. We'll talk about the Amiga, <laughs> and then maybe we'll talk about Tandy's. Be an all-Apple show next week. All right, guys, that's it for this week. I'll see you all uh, next week. Bye-bye.